Tonight, we recall two gatherings, two moments in history when God's people are waiting for God to act. At both points, powerful enemies seek to entrap them, and yet God delivers them. These aren't two unrelated events, but tonight we see how God's rescue of his people has always pointed ahead to Jesus' coming rescue and salvation. In the first gathering, we are transported back to a night in Egypt. Plagues have devastated the nation, but Pharaoh will not let God's people, the Israelites, go. They remain enslaved under the rule of Pharaoh. Through Moses and Aaron, God now tells the Israelites to take an unblemished lamb, one without defect, slaughter it, and spread some of its blood on the door frames of the house in which they are to eat the lamb. The lamb is the substitute, the sacrifice, the innocent one who dies in the place of another. Because of the blood of the lamb, the judgment of God passes over the Israelites. That night, God passed over all Egypt, executing his judgment. Death came to every firstborn human and animal. Death came to every household. But the Israelites were spared. For the blood of the lamb was a sign that one had already died for them. Because of God's actions, the Israelites were now free to leave slavery. Because of God, Pharaoh wants them out. Each year, the Passover was a reminder of God's saving actions in bringing them out of Egypt. This rescue mission wasn't planned by humans, for it was the Lord's Passover. And now, Jesus' disciples gather to celebrate the Passover, just as they have done every year of their lives. Jesus directs them to whose house they're going to gather at, and Jesus seems to have it all sorted. But this Passover will be radically different from any before. The lamb will be missing from the meal and yet before them in Jesus. They won't only recall God's past acts of salvation for Israel, but in the next few days, witness God's salvation for all. Jesus' hour is approaching. And with it, his enemies also assemble to plot Jesus' death. Then the chief priests and the elders of the people assembled in the palace of the high priest, whose name was Caiaphas, and they schemed to arrest Jesus secretly and kill him. But not during the festival, they said, or there may be a riot among the people. As the disciples gather to celebrate the Passover, momentum against Jesus gathers, and finally his persecutors seize their opportunity. Jesus' betrayer sits amongst them. Then one of the twelve, the one called Judas Iscariot, went to the chief priest and asked, what are you willing to give me if I deliver him over to you? So they counted out for him 30 pieces of silver, from then on, Judas watched for an opportunity to hand him over. As Jesus' hour approaches and his enemies assemble in the shadow of the cross, we see Jesus willingly moving towards his death that would bring salvation for the world. His enemies plan for his death. And Jesus knows that a sacrificial lamb is needed to destroy death. Two opposing plans on the trajectory towards the cross. Tonight, we too recall God's salvation plan in action. The past, the future, rushing together in Jesus. Tonight, with some discomfort, we are reminded that Jesus must serve us. And tonight, we receive a meal that points to the nature 
of Jesus' sacrificial death. God has rescued his people from world powers, and now he comes to rescue us from the power of sin and death. Jesus' hour is approaching. He wraps a towel around his waist and begins to wash the disciples' feet. In these last moments with the disciples, Jesus' actions reveal his priorities. Not that the disciples would be a little bit cleaner, but that they would know that they can only be clean through him. As he gets closer to the cross, the most important thing for the disciples to be reminded of, and us, in a very practical and tangible way, is that Jesus must serve us, or we have no part with him. Will we let him? While some cultures, it might be polite to take your shoes off inside, washing the feet of visitors is a bit strange. But for those in the first century, this was a sign of hospitality, a lowly task done by the lowest ranked slaves. And yet, the disciples' teacher, their Lord, in full knowledge of his divinity, takes up this lowly position to serve them. Jesus' humility doesn't end with this towel basin and grimy feet, but will go further for them and for us. In humility, Jesus will face a shameful death, being exposed on a cross. At one level, here Jesus sets the example for his disciples. Not specifically that they should always be armed, ready to wash feet, but in the pattern and model of servant-shaped discipleship, Jesus tells them, Now that I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also should wash one another's feet. I have set you an example that you should do as I have done for you. But Jesus' actions are bigger than just preparing them to serve each other. Kneeling down before them, he wants them to understand what he is about to do. When Jesus comes to Peter down the foot washing line, Peter balks. No, said Peter, you shall never wash my feet. Jesus answered, unless I wash you, you have no part with me. Then Lord, Simon Peter replied, not just my feet, but my hands and my head as well. Jesus clearly wasn't there to give Peter a bath, something that could be undone the moment he stepped out of the room. But rather, he came to give Peter a permanent cleansing, one that could be only achieved by the Son of God. For it is because Jesus was from God and returning to God that he came to wash the disciples' feet. He came to cleanse them from their sin. And he came to cleanse us from our sin. The disciples, along with all Jewish people, were familiar with ceremonial washing, purification practices that had to be repeated to be clean in God's sight. And yet this permanent cleansing, the permanent removal of the stain of sin, well, that could only be done by God. Jesus must serve them. Jesus must serve us. When others serve us, it's easy to be uncomfortable, to feel ashamed that we have put ourselves in a position that we need help, or feel uncomfortable that others have been inconvenienced to serve us. And yet in front of God, we do need help. And the only one who can help us is Jesus. For us to be clean, 
to be with Jesus and welcomed into God's family. We must allow Jesus to serve us. Will you let him? Jesus' hour is approaching. The disciples are gathered, ready for the Passover meal to begin. They would have known the words, recalling God's salvation of his people from Egypt. They would have expected Jesus to lead them in remembering their history. But something strange happens. The lamb is missing and Jesus changes the words. Suddenly it becomes about him. Jesus takes the bread and says, this is my body. Jesus takes the wine and says, this is my blood. God's ultimate salvation was not escape from Pharaoh, but the lamb that rescued the people from death and judgment is now before them. He is the innocent one, the sacrifice, whose blood spread across a wooden frame will mean freedom for God's people. Firmly in sight is the cross. Jesus' execution is not a surprise to him. It's not a sign that Jesus was finally outwitted by his opponents or that he placed his trust in the wrong people. But with all authority, Jesus gives his disciples bread and wine. He gives the disciples symbols of his broken body and blood. Jesus' death, like the lamb, is given for them. His body and his blood given for us for the forgiveness of sins. Here at this meal, Jesus is pointing to a new covenant which God institutes forever. Not a temporary political rescue, but freedom from the powers of sin and death where judgment and sin are passed over, where someone else stands in our place, takes our death so that we can have forgiveness. Jesus died for us once for all, that we might join him in the Father's kingdom for eternity. In this meal, Jesus gives us his broken body and blood. But this isn't the last meal, for we look forward to feasting with Jesus in the new creation, the new heavens and the new earth. And whilst it might seem distant now, that way has been made possible because Jesus goes before us to the cross. In this one meal, we can look back and recall God's salvation, Jesus' broken body and blood given for us so that with joy and thanksgiving, we can look ahead with hope to our future. Jesus' hour has come. The disciples walk with Jesus out of the city, down the valley to the Mount of Olives. They have that fresh feel with feet being washed. Their hunger is satisfied. And yet, a sense of foreboding remains. Unbeknownst to them, Jesus faces his greatest opponent, the full weight of evil, sin and death. In the garden, Jesus' humanity is laid bare. His soul is overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death. His path to the cross has been set, and yet no step is easy. Surely there must be another way. Falling to the ground, Jesus prays that the cup be taken from him. This is not the same cup that Jesus gave, but is a metaphor the prophets used to represent the cup of God's wrath against all injustice, against all evil inflicted by nations and by people. 
No one would want this cup. But there is no one here forcing Jesus' hand. And yet willingly, according to the Father's will, he drinks it, taking upon himself the sin of the whole world. In this moment, we see Jesus' commitment to our salvation. In his darkest hours, Jesus' friends are asleep. He is betrayed by one of his closest. He faces sorrow to the point of death. Abandoned, alone, in the darkness, with the weight of the sin of the world. And yet, he continues. For those he loves, for those scheming against him, for those who are indifferent, for you and for me. Jesus willingly goes to the cross for the salvation of the world. Salvation is free for us, but it is not free for God. He will embrace death so that we can receive 